For the people working at Tyco International during the early 2000s, their horrible boss experience took it to a whole new level. In 2002, Tyco CEO Dennis Kozlowski and his right-hand man were caught with their hands in the company cookie jar. The greedy corporate bigwigs had been draining millions from their own company for years, but nobody said a word until they had already scammed upwards of half a billion dollars. How were they able to cover up the massive theft for so long, and why did they continue to justify their crimes even after getting caught? Kozlowski wasn't always a high-flying millionaire pulling off elaborate corporate fraud in his spare time. He grew up as an average kid from Newark, New Jersey. Kozlowski's parents worked common folk jobs for the city, his mother a school crossing guard, his father a public transit employee. Despite his modest upbringing, the future CEO always had big aspirations. He wanted to exceed society's expectations and leave his humble beginnings in the rearview mirror. Kozlowski decided to try his hand in the business world at college. He applied for a job at a little company called Tyco Incorporated in 1975. Tyco, at the time, was not the billion-dollar stock market darling, not yet. They had, however, experienced some moderate successes over their first few years in business. They started out as a small-time investment firm, focusing primarily on military research and development both in the government and private sectors. Through the 60s, they shifted their operations to material science and energy conservation projects, hoping to hop on the train of innovative technology before it left the station. In the mid-70s, Tyco adopted an aggressive acquisition strategy. They sought to diversify their corporation by purchasing various technology-based companies and manufacturers, and it worked. By the time young Dennis Kozlowski became a part of the Tyco family, the company had just gotten a place on the New York Stock Exchange, and it was posting sales figures in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The 80s were a time for Tyco to regroup and reorganize. Kozlowski saw this as an opportunity to prove his worth in the growing company, climbing up the management rank. The Newark native claimed the keys to the Tyco Kingdom in 1992. He took over as the company's CEO and immediately brought back the acquisition strategy that had made the 70s such a lucrative decade. Kozlowski's plan of action was even more aggressive than his predecessors, though. In fact, for the first 10 years, Tyco brought in something in the realm of 3,000 different companies to their rapidly expanding corporate empire. The scorched earth approach to mergers and acquisitions was unheard of at this time, and it left Wall Street know it alls baffled. Never before had a company sought to transform itself into such an expensive mega conglomerate with so many subsidiaries beneath its umbrella. Tyco was among the first to blaze this trail, and the strategy has since become a common business practice. With Kozlowski steering the ship to new heights of success, the company rebranded to Tyco International, a name that better described the global reach of their operation. The majority of their work now centered around security systems after they merged with ADT Security in the mid-90s. Profits ballooned, and to save every penny they could, Tyco HQ moved to Bermuda a tax haven. By the turn of the century, Tyco was posting revenue numbers in the multi-billion, riding the wave of their acquisitions game plan. They were considered one of the safest blue-chip investments on the market thanks to their well-founded infrastructure and diverse revenue stream. Dennis Kozlowski started living it up. He spared no expense as he reveled in the opulent lifestyle his salary afforded him. However, it was the company fitting the bill for his out-of-control spending, not Kozlowski himself. Take his luxury apartment, for instance. He picked out a beautiful suite and a high-end apartment building in New York City, a proper castle for the Tycho King himself. They say living in New York is expensive, and this place proved that in spades. The price tag on Kozlowski's new home was $30 million. That's a whole lot of money for just one apartment. Kozlowski agreed, which is why he had Tycho pay for it as part of his CEO compensation package. It wasn't just the apartment itself either. Kozlowski outfitted his humble home with outrageous expenditures that no one in their right mind would consider necessary. Infamously, his shower curtains alone cost $6,000, and he had a set of umbrella stands priced out at another fifteen grand. Who needs $15,000 umbrella stand? Apparently, Kozlowski does, as he embraced the life of a millionaire when he didn't have to pay for it himself. In addition to the NYC apartment, he owned several acres of a gated community in Boca Raton, Florida, and bought himself a beachfront estate on Nantucket Island. But it wasn't all shower curtains and umbrella holders for Kozlowski. To celebrate his second wife's 40th birthday, he organized the party to end all parties on the Italian island of Sardinia, featuring a live
live performance by Jimmy Buffett. A Michelangelo ice sculpture even spat high-priced vodka into a fountain. The expensive shindig cost about $2 million. To get Tycho to help pay for it all, Kozlowski doubled his wife's birthday party as a Tycho shareholders meeting. A business expense. Because it was technically a company function, Tycho paid half the bill. Also, the CEO and his wife could party hard on an island halfway across the world. The blowout symbolized the parasitic relationship Tycho had with Kozlowski. Even if he was the CEO, he was helping himself to the company's cash. No questions asked. No apologies made. More on that later, though. Even with Kozlowski's reckless spending, he helped turn Tycho into a billion-dollar enterprise. Just when it seemed like the Tycho tidal wave could not be stopped, the company showed signs of splitting at the seams. The aggressive acquisitions may have multiplied their profits, but they also made their day-to-day -day operations very expensive. As the 2000s began, they were inundated in long-term debt, roughly $80 billion of it be exact. Stock prices dropped when Kozlowski announced the plans to split Tyco International into four individual companies to manage their subsidiaries in various sectors. After the overwhelmingly negative response to his plans, Kozlowski backpedaled and opted to continue Tyco's storied history of acquisition. 2002, it all caught up to them. Due to the crippling debt, Tyco posted a $9 billion loss, despite bringing in more than $30 billion in total revenue. The complex network of subsidiaries that Kozlowski helped build over the years was bleeding the company dry as the complications stemming from their electronics projects got more expensive. Tyco's stock took a nosedive, and Wall Street's golden boy turned into his red-headed stepchild within a matter of months. As if the company's massive debts weren't enough of a financial burden, Tyco was about to be embroiled in a massive corporate scandal involving their big spending CEO. Apparently, Kozlowski was stealing money directly from the company, not only in the form of luxury homes and ridiculous parties, though. He and his CFO, Mark Swartz, had been siphoning millions of dollars from Tyco for years without the company's knowledge. Both Swartz and Kozlowski insisted the money they took was part of the compensation packages authorized by the Tyco Board of Directors, but these desperate claims fell on deaf ears. In reality, the executives were stealing money masked as unauthorized loans. They artificially inflated the company's stock price by forging fraudulent sales numbers in the books and then sold those bloated shares for a profit. Their scam went unchecked for years because of their standing within Tyco's hierarchy. The bosses called their phony loans executive bonuses. If an employee raised an eyebrow at their shady practices, they would intimidate them into submission, throwing around their power and influence to get what they wanted. In some cases, they even paid off Tyco employees to stay silent after discovering their theft. What motivated the widespread fraud? Well, take it from Kozlowski himself, who later said it was greed, pure and simple. They were big shots at a successful company, and undoubtedly making more money than a person needs even without the scam. That was not enough. In the end, Kozlowski and his accomplice swiped about $600 million from their own company and ultimately paid dearly for it. They were brought to trial in 2004, but a bizarre incident, including one of the jurors, allowed Kozlowski and Swartz to get off scot-free, at least for the time being. A jury member appeared to make an OK sign to the defense team as she walked past them, and the public quickly interpreted this as a show of solidarity between Kozlowski and a woman tasked with objectively judging him. Even though the juror insisted she meant nothing by the gesture, the judge ruled it a mistrial. Corporate criminals would still need to face their fate eventually. In 2005, they were put back on trial, and no misunderstanding with the jury would lessen the consequences this time around. Despite their argument that the compensation they were given while working at Tyco was legitimate and approved by the board, the evidence against them said otherwise. They were convicted on more than 20 counts of various financial crimes and subsequently hauled off to prison. Their prison sentences were set at no less than 8 years, but no more than 25. They were also ordered to pay $134 million in restitution and were both hit with additional fines in the millions of dollars. Kozlowski was a very wealthy man, so he'd have no problem paying off his debts, right? Well, in 2010, his wallet got a little lighter after his old company filed a lawsuit against him. Tyco International cited the Faithless Servant Doctrine, claiming its former CEO had to forfeit all previous compensation he received during his tenure. The Faithless Service Doctrine is a legal principle that states any employee who acts unfaithfully towards their own company forfeits their right to compensation from said company. A judge ruled in Tyco's favor during the 2010 suit, so Kozlowski had to give up the $500 million he received from 1997 to 2002. In January of 2014, the disgraced CEO 
CEO was set free through a work release program. He started volunteering at the Fortune Society, a nonprofit that works with ex inmates as they transition back into the outside world. He has seemingly turned the page on his criminal history and even remarried after his second wife filed for divorce while he was behind bars. His old buddy, Mark Swartz, got an early release as well. As those two pick up the pieces of their shattered past, the company they left in shambles has undergone some major changes of its own. Tyco eventually merged with Johnson Controls in 2016. The multinational corporation, now called Johnson, Johnson Controls International is alive and well, with revenue well into the billions of dollars once again. It seems everything worked out for all parties involved, but Kozlowski's story remains a cautionary tale about the perils of corporate excesses and how putting too much power in one man's hands will almost always end in catastrophe. Click here to watch one of these next videos.